Tervetuloa sitten takaisin lounastauolle. Toivottavasti kaikki ovat syöneet hyvin. Ja seuraavana sitten tietoisuusvaiheesta hevosen hyvinvoinnin huolta, hevosen hyvinvoinnista huolehtiminen tällä kansallisella tasolla. Ja sitten jos vielä kiinnostaa sitten tuossa varttia yli, mitä esitys päättyy, niin sitten seuraavaksi vain siirrytään sitten sinne kansainvälisen tason hevosten huoltoihin. Ja Meistä taisi olla suuri kaikki katsomassa sitä äskeistä esitystä jo, niin Iimon ei tässä sen suurempia esittelyitä kaipaa, eli maajoukkueen lääkäri 2015 vuodesta. Mr. McLaughlin, please. Thank you. So in this talk I'm going to talk about the veterinary aspects of day-to-day -day management at home, common problems that are encountered, some of how them are treated, and, somehow, and how some of them can be avoided. So, there are a number of things that go together. Keeping a healthy horse, there are many factors to consider when looking after competition horses. Keeping horses healthy and fit for competition requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of dedication. So feeding and nutrition is a vast subject, and I'll just touch on some of the bits that are important to me as a vet. Um, obviously, the diet of an individual horse will vary according to its size, its work, and its temperament. There's very good nutrition advice available from most of the major feed companies on specifically what you should feed for different exercise requirements. But the most vet common veterinary problems that are seen related to feeding are colic, gastric ulcers, and exertional rhabdomyolysis or tying up. So, with colic, colic simply means abdominal pain and there are multiple different causes of abdominal pain. The horse's gut is complex and can go wrong in many ways. Broad categories are impaction, which is a blockage of the gut contents. There are several places where this is more likely to happen, which are typically places where the intestines turn a corner. This is the equivalent of the U-bend under a sink, where blockages most often occur. This type of colic is normally treated by the administration of fluids and other substances to soften the gut contents and allow them to pass through. In extreme cases where the blockage cannot be managed medically, then surgery may be required to clear the blockage. The second type is gas distension or displacement. That should say gas, not gastric. Sack my PowerPoint writer. Um, the horse's hind gut is basically a very large fermentation chamber which allows the horse to break down cellulose from grass and other forage to convert to energy. This process produces large amounts of gas and in some cases, and we don't know particularly why, the gas will build up in a particular area of the gut and cause that area to become painful or to move out of place. Management of this type of colic involves administration of painkillers and exercise to try and encourage the gas to move through and the displaced gut to move back into a normal position. Normally the horse would be lunged, but I find that taking the horse for a horse box ride can be more effective in moving the gut back into place. And in extreme cases, where the, basically where the pain can't be managed, then surgery is the option to try and reverse this type of abnormality. The third thing is intestinal twists, entrapments, and strangulations. These are a medical emergency. Again, for some reason we don't understand, the intestine can twist over on itself, become entrapped in a, no in a number of different cavities between organs, or become trapped by small tumours called lipomas which grow inside the abdomen. If this type of colic is suspected, this is immediate take to the hospital, possible surgery. Uh, sand colic then, so I know it's something you get quite a bit of in Finland, um, in horses that are kept on sand paddocks, it's common for them to pick up varying amounts of sand with the feed. The sand gravitates in the gut. It can build up to cause a blockage. It can cause pain while it's moving through, or it can irritate the lining of the gut to cause diarrhea. Treatment involves administration of painkillers to control discomfort where necessary. And psyllium, which is a substance which binds sand and helps it to pass through the gut, should be administered both as a treatment and a preventative measure. Then we've got diarrhea, multiple different causes for diarrhea. It typically happens because there's a disturbance in the gut flora, the bacteria in the gut which keep the gut healthy. 
and treatment of mild cases involves administrations of probiotic to rebalance the gut flora. And in some more severe cases, if they've lost significant fluid, they'll require intravenous fluids, electrolytes, and plasma volume expanders to support the system until the gut stabilizes. The next thing which is important in competition horses is gastric ulceration. Um, you'll find I keep mentioning gastric ulceration today, they're a big thing for me. Um, this may be due to excessive gastric acid production because of stress or certain types of medication, or it can be due to long periods where the stomach is empty. These are both things which make the gut, gut lining come into contact with excessive amounts of acid. I include it under other types of colic because colic can be one of the symptoms of gastric ulceration, but there are many other signs associated with gastric ulceration, including weight loss, girthiness or discomfort in the horse's girth, poor appetite or refusal to eat certain things, poor competition performance, typically cramping over show jumps or tension in the dressage movements, teeth grinding when the horse is ridden, or just general bad behaviour. So, these are the results of various different surveys. The 37% of leg horses get gastric ulcers, so they don't need to be under a huge amount of pressure to, for one in three horses still to have them. 63% of performance horses and 93% of race horses. It's therefore a very important differential to look at when considering reasons for poor performance of competition horses. It's easy to diagnose. We do it by endoscopy of the stomach lining. There are different types and different degrees of ulceration which require different treatment. Therefore, it's important to scope the horse first rather than just administering anti-acid medication. So on the left here is a normal stomach. Ooh, it was a normal stomach. So you've got the white part at the top, which is just the same as the lining in the roof of our mouth. It's a protective layer of skin. And you've got the pink part at the bottom, which is the area that produces acid, some of the early enzymes which start the process of digestion. In the image on the right, a little bit dark, but you can see that this white area, which is to the left now, which is on the top on the other image, has got these huge pits which are areas where the lining of the stomach has been burnt away. The pink area isn't terribly visible on this. This horse had a normal, what's called glandular mucosa. So we're looking at the white part, which is the squamous mucosa. We've got these big pits, huge ulcers. The lining of the stomach is trying to come up over these and close them. So you get these what look like moon craters, where the skin thickens up and it's trying to push its way over these ulcerated areas and trying to close them up. But all the time, at the same time, you've got the acid from the stomach pouring onto these areas and ulcerating them further. So it's a vicious cycle. The other type of ulceration that we get is in the pink part, um, typically around the valve at the exit to the stomach. So we've got normal on the left here, these are called glandular ulcers. Normal, you've got this valve which leads into the small intestine and a lot of foldings and things around it. This is abnormal, you've got an ulcer here, ulcer here, there's a small one here as well. There's a bit of bruising here, and there's a big ulcer here. So ulceration in this area of the stomach can be extremely painful. The other type is painful, but this type, from talking to people who have had ulceration in this area, is very painful, what they call peptic ulcers in people. Um, these ulcers in particular, because they're at the bottom of the stomach, are going to be under pressure every time that the food passes through, because the food has to pass through here to get to the small intestine. So you, when you get ulcers, the food's going to be rubbing on them and causing actually a physical irritation at the same time as the acid, get the acid that runs into the surface. So these are very difficult to treat. So the treatment of these ulcers is the squamous ulcers, the ones at the top, which they generally should be more straightforward to treat. It's a matter of switching off the acid these proton pump inhibitors, which are meprazole, gastrogard, heptazole, um, ulcer gold, there's many different ones available now, it used to be just gastrogard, um, but they switch off the acid production so that you can't get that burning on this surface anymore. By switching off the acid, you allow the skin to do what it's trying to do and come across and heal that area. 
You've also got uh, histamine antagonists like ranitidine, Zantac, things like that, not reliably effective in horses, but are sometimes used in, in, in some cases. Um, typically, in, where I would use them is in race horses in the UK, we're allowed to use ranitidine, but we're not allowed to use omeprazole. Um, anti-acid supplements, so there's a variety of different anti-acid supplements on the market, um, and they're basically aimed at increasing the pH in the stomach, making it more alkaline, reducing the acid, reducing the burning. Um, dietary modification is the main thing, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Dietary modification, both to decrease the physical pressure on the ulcers, and also to limit the amount of acid that is left in contact with the stomach lining. Um, treatment of glandular ulcers, these other types, it's the same first four things. Then, in addition to treat those, those treatments, in people, glandular ulcers are associated with bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Um, and in people, it's, they don't even necessarily have a gastroscopy, it's a simple test to say they're, they're blood test to say they're positive for Helicobacter and they have ulcer treatment. Um, we don't have a definite bacteria that causes this in horses. But we know that a lot of these horses don't get better until we give them antibiotics. So we use the other things like the gastroprotectant medication, a drug called sucralfate, which is called forms of film over the line of the stomach, to protect the gut and try and, when the food's passing through, we try and stop it from causing so much pressure and irritation to that area, even when we've switched off the acid. Um, but some of those still don't get better. And in that case, we use antibiotics. And most of the horses that we use antibiotics on these ulcers keep them. So, risk factors for colic. Stress. Stress increases cortisol production, which increases gastric acid. Then we've got a change in feeding, or an inappropriate feeding. We've got increased time spent indoors, probably relates to stress and, um, and irregular feeding, as much as anything else, but I, not the actual housing. In, um, Increased age, and these are actually these are, these are all risk factors for colic overall, not just gastric ulcers. Increased age for horses with any type of colic. We don't particularly know why. The computer's just crashing. Um, uh, one obvious thing is the horses that get lipomas in the gut, they're more likely to have those when they're older. Um, but other types of colic just seem to happen more in older horses, we don't know why. Um, intestinal parasitism, which I'm stuck on at the moment, is the other thing, so there's a worm. Um, and worms can cause colic both from diarrhea or from um, actually attaching to the gut and affecting the way that the gut moves. So the first three things that were on my list, which I can't get back to at the moment, stress, change in feeding, and increased times in the are things that we can change. We can't change the age of the horse. We can deal with worms. Um, but the main three things are things that we can change in the environment of the competition horse. So we can manage those things in the home environment. It's a bit more difficult in the competition environment. But we should be thinking about those things when we go to the show. In my experience, riders and grooms tend to manage horses well at major international shows. They go to a big international show. It's a big thing. They take a small number of horses. Um, it's important that they do well at these classes and these competitions, so they pay a lot of attention to how they're managed. They get a lot of individual attention. Um, the classes are under regulated schedules. There aren't the same distractions that there are at home. And so they'll tend to look after the horses very well, and there's less chance of them getting colic or ulcers or other things like that. Um, in the day-to-day -day, um, experience of horses going to national shows, particularly in big show jumping yards, um, quite often they don't pay the same attention to their welfare at those shows. They'll have large numbers of horses, the facilities might not be as good, the show isn't as regarded as so important, so they don't think so much about managing the horse, and this often results in horses standing for long periods of time on the truck without food or water, with little attention to optimum feeding times that might be absorbed, uh, observed at international important competitions. So guidelines for feeding, number one is feed as much fibre and forage as possible. 
The current recommendations for 15 grams of dry matter per kilogram of body weight per day, and it can actually be useful to measure that um, because people tend to feed forage on, uh, by forage I mean hay and, and uh, uh, hay leaves and things like that. Um, they tend to feed it by, by eye and by what the horse's weight is doing, but there are actually guidelines on how much you should be feeding, or probably should all be weighing it. Um, the risk of gastric ulceration is greatly decreased by having some fibre continually in the stomach. It absorbs the acid and protects the stomach lining. Um, in horses that are recovering from gastric ulceration, I talk to the owners about feeding them something soft because again, I talked before about physical pressure on those ulcers. And we can switch off the acid to try and get them to heal, but then if we're still feeding them very stocky food material, then that's going to rub the surface and still irritate them. So I encourage them to feed soft porridge to avoid trauma to the damaged stomach lining. And the, one of the best ways I find to do that is steamed hay. Steamed hay is really soft. Um, you should avoid feeding large amounts of straw because straw has been found to increase the risk of gastric ulceration, um, but partly to do with the, the actual make of the straw, partly to do with the physical uh, rubbing. So concentrate feed, feed concentrates in multiple small veins rather than one or two large feeds. And the current recommendation, again, there's a recommendation is less than two grams per kilogram body weight per day of non-structural carbohydrates. Um, and that's something you can speak to feed companies about and get advice on. Um, excess starch and sugars greatly increase the risk of gastric ulceration. If additional energy is needed, then you should add a vegetable oil to the feed. Um, and one thing to consider if you are adding oil is add vitamin E at the same time because vitamin E is needed to process oil. Uh, you should add chaffed concentrate feed, preferably a soft chaff, and if possible containing alfalfa, because that raises the gastric pH, to buffer the stomach acid. By uh, buffer, I mean level out the stomach acid. Um, you should avoid prolonged periods without food, like the fact that we said, but not having the stomach empty with the acid eroding the lining. You should keep water available all the time, which seems obvious, but again, sometimes when people go to shows, they don't think about those things or they get distracted. Um, Avoid cereal-based con concentrates within two to three hours of exercise. So think about your timing of exercise at home, not just at the show. Again, people think, I'm at the show, I'm going to feed the horse two, three hours, whatever suits that horse or whatever the nutritionist is recommending before the class. But then at home, they all get fed at the same time in the morning and the same time in the evening. And they could be exercised at various different times through the day. So what we recommend is that, that you give them their normal feeds at those times because it's part of managing horses that they all get their feed at the same time. But then you should think about giving them smaller feeds um, in, at, at an appropriate time before they exercise. Um, and it's a good idea to add a little bit of chaff or to give a, a soft fiber based feed about half an hour before exercise so that stomach definitely has something in it which can prevent acid erosion. Is it, is it common to have like a hay net when you're at a competition so that the horse has hay like all the yeah. time? No, that's a sensible thing to do. You, you should yeah, get yeah, the hay all the time. The, the, the old fashioned thing was starve the horse before it competes because you know we, we get this thing with our guts which are totally different to horses that when we exercise after a meal we don't feel them. They shouldn't have huge meals. They shouldn't be able to gorge themselves on feed yeah. just before competitions. But a hay net where they can pick a little bit all the time is a good idea. Um, as I say that I just find with some of the, particularly the bigger show jumping yards, they run, run off the show and they've got so many horses and so few grooms that they don't, they don't do it intentionally because they're too busy or they just forget about it. And just a little bit more attention gives the horse a much better chance of performing well. Um, you said uh, it's good to give them something half an hour before the exercise, what about yeah. after? How soon do they need to do their cells? After exercise, so exercise, the adrenaline associated with exercise shuts down the guts, so they, not shuts down completely, but slows down the, the gut movement. So basically any time when the horse has relaxed again after exercise, they can be ready for feeding. Um, well, it's not a good idea to take a hot, uh, that's kind of common sense to take a hot horse 
it's just exercise and throw it into a stable with another feed, those horses quite often get colic. But again, it's something that's done because people are busy, they don't think about it, they give the horse a little wash off, and they chuck it in the stable, and the next thing they're calling, they're saying it's got colic. Um, that's because the guts aren't ready to move yet, because the system hasn't relaxed, and they're eating, and they're, it's causing endorsement and pain. Um, <coughs> Worming, I won't go into too much, I mentioned it already. The, the only thing I would say is that with worming, a lot of pet horse owners do worming better than the big competition yards do. Um, it's a thing that can get forgotten about. There are horses moving in and out all the time, different horses with different riders in the stable and things. And quite often when you go and ask them, when was it last worm, nobody knows. Um, the people with one or two horses at home tend to regulate that very well. Um, so it's something that uh, people need to be reminded of with competition horses, not to forget the basics. Um, the other point to make is that uh, people quite often manage horses at home with worm egg counts, careful pasture management to lower the worm burden, which are all good things to do. But then they go to competition and the horse does well. So as a reward, they go and let it have graze for half an hour on the grass that's the show before they go home. And I just like to remind people that you don't know what the grazing history of that, you, you have been really careful with your land at home and everything, then you don't know what the grazing history is at, at those places where there are multiple horses all the time, so you could be picking up a worm burden to take home. So I recommend people don't graze their horses in competitions, rather bring your own treats to reward the horse for doing well and keep everything in your own control. Um, vaccinations for national competition, probably everybody knows this, but I'll go through it because again, it's something that tends to be missed, forgotten about in big competition yards. They're thinking about bigger things and they forget to get the vaccinations done and then they can't compete. So first vaccination, second one, three weeks to three months later, third one, five to seven months, and boosters for national competitions annually. Um, Vaccination, this is the same for national and international competition, shouldn't be given within seven days of competition. So you need to leave a week after you've done the vaccination before the horse can compete. Um, be careful with horses that are imported from other countries where the national vaccination requirements are different. Typically Holland, where they have the first two vaccinations and then if they skip to a year for the third one, so we get a lot of horses that are brought in from Holland with the vaccination history. The rider looks at the passport and sees that it's had a vaccination within a year, and so it should be okay to compete. And then they go and get the passport checked, and actually it's been vaccinated by the Dutch system, not the Finnish or the English system, and then it's ineligible because it hasn't had that third vaccination. Um, other vaccinations can be done as well, depending on the risk in your own stable or area, uh, for things like tetanus, which should be done anyway, botulism, and equine herpes virus. The next thing to look at is dentistry. I pay a lot of attention to dentistry. Um, when you think about it, we generally control horses by putting various bits into the sensitive tissues of the horse's mouth and pulling against them with our hands. You know, varying degrees of force, and we all try to be gentle with the bit, but that's basically what we're doing. We're, we're controlling the horse by putting pressure in those areas. Um, what we do when we take contact with the bit is this pair of radiograph shows. This is the bit sitting loose with a double bridle. Then we take contact and we move the bits into a position where they are pushing the soft tissues which are in here, which you can't see on x-ray, against the teeth. So people say, well, you don't need to change the teeth because the bits don't come in contact with the teeth, which is true, but the soft tissue that's sitting between is being pinched between the bit and the teeth. So you can see this horse has had this tooth profile to make it smooth and also these, this tooth that's a little bit behind the uh, snaffle ring. Um, it's had these teeth profiled to make it comfortable for when those soft tissues come into contact with the teeth. The other thing about teeth is the horse's teeth grow continuously and they overlap on the cheek teeth. So this is the start of the cheek teeth but they go much further back and they overlap so that there's no contact between the cheek teeth on the inside of the bottom and the outside of the top. And so we ask those to make them uh, comfortable so they don't uh, stick into the tongue or stick into the cheeks. The edges, those edges, um, in the normal run of things in a horse which is grazing, grazing in the paddock, 
they probably don't really cause an issue. A horse that has bad conformation in its mouth, so a horse that has areas at the back or the front where the teeth don't meet and you wind up with, it's easier to see on this one, a hook going down here or a hook going at the back of the other place. Those need 100% need dental attention. Um, the horses that are just living out in the paddock that have overlapping on the outside and the inside, which is normal, natural, everybody asks me what does nature do, those are probably okay if their mouth conformation is good um, because they don't have bits of tack coming down the side of the horse's feet creating pressure. Um, I typically see this with nose bands where you get rubbing and holes basically in the cheeks where the nose band has been done up around the cheek and the sharp edge of the tooth is pushing against the soft tissues. Um, on that note, I think it's fantastic that Finland is leading the way in expanding the choices of the bridle. It's going to be used in competition. And obviously the FBI are listening a little bit because they're starting to make some changes to try and regulate the nose band tightness. That can only be good for the horse. There, there are arguments every way about whether or not you should have a bit, whether or not you should have a double bridle. But at the end of the day, if we can control the horse with the minimal force and without causing pain, then that's going to be good for the horse. And you have to make the teeth nice so that they can smile at the judge. <laughs> so fire area shooting. Again, I could spend the whole day talking about shoeing and foot balance and different shoes. So this is an example of some of the different types of shoes that we use. Um, it's all individual, it all depends on the horse's individual problems. Um, there's an old adage in English that says, no foot, no horse, and I think that translates into every language. Um, and the interaction between the vet and the farrier is an important thing because we've got to manage the soundness between us, between the vet and the farrier, and if we can talk to each other about what the best thing, sometimes argue with each other about what the best thing is to do with the shoeing, um, then we can get the best possible outcome for the horse. And I mentioned it in my first talk, but I, I like to balance the feet to allow for comfortable movement, not for necessarily a pretty foot. I want to give comfortable movement. So this one, again, it doesn't come across very well on the big slide, but th this horse has a twist of the fetlock in the opposite direction to the horse that I spoke about earlier. It turns out from the fetlock, and it therefore has a distorted foot. If you, put, if you were to shoe this foot in a regular way, so you didn't allow this flare and didn't allow it to be steep here, then you would wind up with this part of the foot always landing first and creating pressure. When the vet diagnoses a problem that can be treated by specialist shoeing, it's important to, for them to speak to the farrier about what is the best option for that horse, not just say, put this type of shoe on. But the farrier is the person who knows the horse's feet, who's dealing with it from day to day. Um, we can get nice pictures like this that show that the horse is angling out on both front legs and is creating excessive force through here and through here. And we can send those to the farrier, but the farrier knows what he can get to stick to that horse's feet. He knows how that horse's foot grows every time between when he shoes it, and he knows whether that horse's feet are going to be able to stand up to putting heavier things on, lighter things on, whatever. So we can give them the science, but then we've got to talk to each other about the practical application. Again, I mentioned it earlier, I quite often do balance x-rays, which is the reason this horse was taken was partly because of the lame and partly because of the foot balance. Um, we do balance x-rays, but we take one x-ray from the front and one from the side of every foot, um, roughly six months in a lot of competition forms. Then physical therapies, again, osteopath, chiropractor, physio, all these people who manipulate horses. Um, most of the horses I deal with now, in fact, I would say all of the competition horses I deal with, have regular or intermittent treatment by a physiotherapist, chiropractor, osteopath, or whatever. Somebody is coming in, looking at that horse's soft tissues, massaging or manipulating that horse to try and make it compete better. Um, it's an obvious thing that horses will benefit from a massage like people do, help them loosen up, maybe click a few joints and, and make them feel better. But one of the things that's good for me as a vet is that those people give me information about the horse. So it kind of, I could be a little bit lazy in a way because they can direct me to where they're finding the problem. Um, 
And a lot of the time, those people are identifying problems before the rider does. So the rider is merrily carrying on, thinking the horse is fine, and actually the physical therapist picks up an area that's uncomfortable, and maybe hasn't been before, or is ongoing uncomfortable, and they can't help through massage. Um, very often I'll be contacted directly by the physiotherapist to say you need to go to this stable. The rider is probably too busy to call you, but call them and make arrangements to go there because they've got horses that they've seen. Um, and then on the other, on the flip side of that, when I've seen the horse and treated it, quite often they, because the physical therapist is in regularly, maybe every week or every month, they'll reassess the horse. They'll call me and say, I've seen this horse that you treated, it's better. It's not showing the signs that it should show when I called you to tell you that there's something wrong. Do you want to go see it again or do you want me to tell them to put it back into work? And that makes my life a lot easier and it actually saves time and money for the owner as well. So again, it's a team approach. Um, reproductive management. Um, so in mares, we have a lot of options um, in terms of controlling their behavior. Um, the obvious, the most well-known one is regulate. Um, you can administer it daily, in a, typically in the times when the mare is cycling. But, um, so from November to May, you technically shouldn't need to use regulate. But a lot of people find it still makes a difference if you continue through the winter. So the majority of horses that I deal with have regulate have it all year round. Um, but that doesn't quite fit in with the science of when they're silent, but it, um, that's what the practical experience is. Um, you can insert a marble or put a drop of mineral oil into the uterus to mimic the effect of a pregnancy, which basically balances out the hormones for a period of time, either while the marble is in there or while the oil is having an effect. The trouble is, if you lose the marble and you haven't seen it, then the next thing you know is that the American screen screaming back in the season when you're out of competition and everything goes wrong. Um, Medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is stuff called Depoprovira, is a human contraceptive injection. Um, some people use it for managing atrius and nerves. It's also used for back pain, and because of that, it's, um, it's not allowed to in competition, and it hasn't been very effective with managing atrius and nerves in my experience. Um, Something which has been very effective is anti TNRH vaccine, which is something called Equity or Improvac. Um, that's a vaccination against the sex hormones, so it stops them from producing the hormones which are making them behave badly. Um, the problem with it is that it causes pain and then it's swelling at the injection site. So you do two injections, uh, four weeks apart initially, and then a six monthly booster. So you have to time the injections for times when the mare can actually be a bit sore for a few days um, because it's not something you just give and forget about. You have to actually be able to give them some painkillers and things afterwards because it causes quite a lot of tissue reaction. Um, the other thing is that their future fertility isn't guaranteed. So if you inject a mare with this and they go and give themselves a career ending injury the next day, then you can't just put them into full. You've got to wait for the stuff to wear off and the time for it to wear off is unpredictable. It's competition legal, um, but if you use it, you've got to record it in the passport like you would any other vaccination. Um, oxytocin can be used as well as a course to try and take mares out of season. Um, it's very reliable for some mares, but we don't use it that often, and it's got a 14-day competition control. Stallions, <clears throat> we've got the anti-GNRH vaccine for them as well. We're not allowed to use regulate. Those other things that I discussed, none of those are effective. You can't put a marble in the stallion's uterus. Um, the stallion again it stops the production of sex hormones, so it makes the stallion more docile, easier to handle. Doesn't always, so sometimes the stallion just has an inbuilt behaviour which it's learned through being a stallion all its life that it's going to be angry and aggressive and difficult to handle. And sometimes we give this, and we know we shut down the sex hormones because the testicles actually shrink in size, but the stallion continues to behave in the same way. And that's actually a useful thing because it tells us before we go and surgically castrate the horse, is that actually going to make a difference? Should we geld the horse or not? Um, the beneficial thing with that is that because it shrinks the tissues which are producing testosterone, you actually have less risks with surgery when you go to castrate a mature stallion and this drug. Pain at the injection site again, and it's competition legal. 
that you need to put in the passport. So this seems somewhat reversible or it's that there isn't a reversal that I know of. Okay. So again, that, that's the issue. If you want to send your stallion to stud, so someone will say to me, I've heard there's this chemical castration. Can you give it to this stallion because we want to keep his concentration for a couple of years while he goes and wins some young horse classes, and then we're going to start collecting from him and, and using him as a stallion. And I have to warn those people then that we don't know when the fertility will come back. So I get some horses where three, four months they need it again. It doesn't fit the regular six month schedule. And equally get some other horses where two, three years later nothing has come back. Um, so it, you basically don't use the horse for the breeding style at some point in his career. So the mares you can't predict? Really you can't predict the mares either though, so it's the same thing. So routine yeah. soundness checks, sorry. Uh, Instead of gelding. Uh, for that reason, to, to manage the silent for a while and then want to breed from it. So some of them will take a chance that the fertility doesn't return. They, they still want the horse to be entire in case they want to use it. Um, some people don't like the idea of the horse having a general anaesthetic, which is fair enough because there are you know, one in a hundred horses die on the general anaesthetic. And that was the same figure 40, 50 years ago. We don't. We still haven't found a way to 100% keep horses alive when we do general anaesthetics. So there are risks there, and I, again, because of risks, I always recommend that mature stylings are castrated on general anaesthetic. So again, it's to avoid that. Um, and often we'll do it as a test. You know, is it going to make a difference to castrate this horse? And if you do, if you do the chemical castration vaccine and they don't improve in their temperament, then it's not going to make a difference. Um, I go on to the routine soundness checks. So, historically, people would have the vet on a fire brigade basis. So, something goes wrong and you call the vet and they come in with everything screaming and jump out and fix the problem. You know. um, there are routine procedures to have the vet for as well, like vaccination and dentistry that I talked about. But otherwise, people have normally only called the vet when something goes wrong. They don't really want to see the vet coming. Um, but it's become more common to have general checkovers overs of competition horses, um, just to check them on an intermittent basis in order to know that the general health is okay and identify any low grade problems before they become more serious. Uh, many people equate this examination to having an MOT on a car. We call it the MOT in in the UK. Um, I believe the word in Finnish is katsastus. Um, sorry if I got that wrong, but that, that basically the idea. It's like an, an annual or more often than that check to see that everything's okay. It's like we all drive around in our cars thinking that everything is fine, and then we take them for the annual inspection and they tell us actually all these things are wrong. And you know, horses are no different. So sometimes we think everything's been okay, the horse has been performing well, and then I see that horse, which was never sore on the flexion test, is really sore. And so we have to step in and try and do something about it before the horse goes wrong, um, before we have to be the fire brigade, effectively. Um, sometimes this inspection is done by the horse's regular vet. Sometimes it's an outside vet who specializes in sport horse work. Um, but the most important thing is to have them done by somebody who understands the horse's discipline. Uh, somebody who is interested in horse sport and understands the demands that the horse will face at its level of work and somebody that has a good knowledge of competition and draw times as well because you don't want to get caught for doping in any circumstance. Um, I've described my approach to these exams before. Um, there are a wide variety of low grade conditions which affect performance. Um, the main thing is getting them at an early stage treating them, making the horse comfortable, stopping things from going drastically wrong. Uh, you should time the checks to coincide with the change in the horse's work level. So typically, if it's going to be under more pressure, if it's going to be in an intensive competition period, or you're going to up the training level, get the horse checked first, make sure that everything is good at starting at that point. Again, if the horse is going to have a break from competition, it can be a good time to check for wear and tear. From what it's done recently or in the past. Um, 
and it's important to plan these visits in advance to make sure you've got sufficient withdrawal time for treatments. Um, I quite often get people calling me saying, oh, I have to try and describe it. Oh no, um, we were just about to go to a major competition and we just realised the horse hasn't had its hocks injected for 13 months or something and we normally haven't done it in 12 and we don't have time. Doping wise, we can't do it. The horse isn't in its optimum health going to the competition. So you have to plan in advance. Um, first aid, that's an idea of a basic first aid kit. Um, the main thing that you're going to be dealing with is an owner rather than a vet. So if something goes wrong, you're going to call the vet. But there are things that you can do while you're waiting for the vet to come. Um, the main thing is bleeding. So you get a wound, it's bleeding heavily, you want to be able to cover the wound, control the bleeding, keep everything clean until the vet arrives. Um, have things for, and again, people, even high level riders quite often don't have this stuff in the truck. Nail pullers for help taking the nails out so you can get a shoe off easily when the shoe is half twisted around and you can't stand the tip. Um, scissors to be able to cut something loose. This is my expandable bucket, which everybody always loves. So have a clean bucket so that if you get a horse with a wound, you can put clean water in it, have a bottle of clean water and clean it up with some antiseptic so that you get rid of the contamination and the infection as early as possible even before the vet season. The other thing is have a twitch, put it in the truck, have it there for the strength so if the horse is anxious and frightened, you have something to be able to settle it down while you do something with it. A situation where you might have that horse anxious and frightened is a nail in the foot. Don't be tempted to pull these out. Try and keep the horse on its toe, bandage it or something. You know, put, put something around to bulk out the area around the base of the nail because if that horse stands on its heel, it's going to push the nail further. It's why people want to take them out. But something like this, where you can take a reading graph and see exactly where the nail is, makes this case much easier to deal with. If somebody has taken that nail out, I don't know if that nail stopped there or if it went through the deep flexor tendon here or if it actually went into a different angle and went into the back of the coffin joint. Um, having the nail in place when the vet arrives means we can properly establish where it's gone. National anti-doping rules. So the national anti-doping rules in Finland are mainly the same as those for FBI competition. These can be found on the website. And if any information isn't available on that site, come consult the Finnish Trotting Association rules. Um, the important thing to note is that antibiotics are permitted for FEI competition but not for Finnish national competition. In addition, on Neprazole, it's allowed to be used in competitions. FEI competitions, you don't need any paperwork. Finnish national competitions, you should have a note from the vet to say this horse has been diagnosed with ulcers and needs to have a Neprazole um, given to it. Um, Regument of Trinitest has to be declared in FEI competitions and again you should have a note from the vet national competition as well to say that that horse is supposed to be on that medication. And the main thing to say about doping is if you're in doubt, if you don't know whether something tests or how long, check with the vet. And if you still don't know, if the vet doesn't know, don't use it. Any questions? Everything seems to be crystal clear now. Well, then just people are tired of eating. <laughs> yeah. How common are the vaccines for, for the anti gonadotropic uh, releasing hormone vaccine? How, how common are they in the UK or Ireland? Uh, quite common in stallions. Mm -hmm. Not so much in mares. People tend to use other things in mares. Mm -hmm. um, but we get quite a lot of stallions. To be quite honest, I think most people who are using it where they think they might use the stallion for the line are dreaming. You know, in the world we live in now, competition stallions are competition stallions from a very early age. You know, they're born of big studs. The studs identify that that horse has the ingredients to be a stallion and it is produced the whole way through as a stallion. There are very few horses that are kept entire, go on to be good competition horses and then wind up being commercial breeding stallions. Um, so it's, it's relatively common, but the good thing for me is I can say to the owner, give this and see if it makes a difference. 
and then I can encourage them to castrate the horse. And then when we do castrate the horse, because of the physical effect that you have on the tissues of shrinking things, then the risk of surgery was less. <laughs> I have Felix clients. I have treated one Finnish horse without medication. Um, an old one. Mm, Stalin. Um, and I don't know how widespread it's used. Most people don't seem to, to know about it, but it's something that I don't that often get into talking. I, I don't see that many Stalins when I come to Finland. So, um, you know, from the point of view, the population of horses I'm looking at when I come to Finland is mainly dressage horses. Mainly mares and yellings. And what about dog okay for the dog? It's not okay for uh, standard bread racing and thoroughbred racing. Yeah. Um, it's allowed for, um, and it, yeah. it didn't. It didn't used to be testable, but they've recently found a way of testing for it. They published a paper on it to say we can test for it and this is how. Um, but still, that's part of the reason why it must be recorded in the passport or FBI or national competing horses to say the horses have this. Because it's, it, it's not seen as being performance enhancing. And there are all sorts of debates around different drugs for that. It's like with um, omeprazole, again, in, in racing horses, omeprazole isn't allowed. And I, don't, I think that's a welfare concern. Because I don't think, I think you bring the horse to a normal state by giving it omeprazole, you don't enhance its performance. And again, if you go on the other side, and if you're giving the horse testosterone to increase its masculinity, to increase its performance, that's obviously not allowed. But if you're doing something to suppress the distraction, basically, around doing this job, then you're not giving it a performance enhancing medication. Though the argument would be, when it comes to breeding, are breeders getting the genuine appreciation of how that horse is in the competition arena? You know, they think they're going to breed a nice quiet horse from that quiet stallion, and actually it's been chemically quiet. So. Because that's logically refused to say that it's too. So. Yeah.